Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again today. Welcome to Worship and the Word with us here at Church of the True Vine. I pray that God would bless you today as we spend this time together. I'm going to read this morning from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What wonderful, wonderful words from the Apostle Paul, a man who knew what it was to suffer hardship and particularly to suffer hardship for the name of Jesus Christ. All around the world today, people are being persecuted because they are believers in Jesus Christ. And yet there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is our hope. This is our certain truth as we go through difficulties, as we go through trials and tribulations, that nothing at all in heaven or in earth can separate us from the love of God. There is huge comfort and hope in these words. So if you are struggling today, just know that you cannot be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Of course, all around the world, as I say, people are persecuted simply for being believers in Jesus Christ. And every week we pray for a different nation where Christians are persecuted for being followers of Jesus Christ. This week we're praying for the nation of Vietnam. The Open Doors World Watch List booklet for 2023 lists Vietnam as the 25th most dangerous country in the world for Christians to live. Let's see what the World Watch List booklet has to say regarding what life is like for Christians in Vietnam. The communist government monitors Christian activity and exercises a high level of pressure on all Christians. Believers who gather in house churches are closely monitored and face discrimination from government and society. Converts from a Buddhist or ethnic animist background face the most severe persecution, not only from the authorities, but also from families, friends and neighbours. They are sometimes forced to leave their villages, yet their numbers are reported to be growing. Please, please join with us later this morning as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Vietnam. And of course, we are continuing to pray regarding this appalling conflict in Vietnam. But now let's turn our attention, our focus to worshipping this God who will not allow us to be separated from his love, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're going to sing together that beautiful old hymn. My song is love unknown, my Saviour's love for me. God bless you as we worship the Lord together today. My 
song is love unknown. My Savior's love to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take for a flesh? reading today from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. There is some debate between scholars as to whether this should actually be uh, recorded as a parable or whether Jesus was actually recounting something that actually happened. Either way, that debate aside, 
the message is very, very clear and it's very, very stark. The message is this. Whatever happens in this life, there is a life to come. And in that life to come, there are only two places you can be in heaven or in hell. And there is no transfer available from hell to heaven. Once you are in hell, that is it. Jesus would mention purgatory if purgatory existed. It's not possible to work off your debt of sin while you're in hell. Jesus makes it quite clear that once somebody is in hell, that's it. There is no return. There is no getting out. There is no managing to, to somehow get yourself out of hell and into heaven. It's a very, very stark message. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. If Jesus brings a message like this, then you have to believe that this message is true. Otherwise, Jesus would be a liar and you could disc discredit everything that he ever said. But we see through the life and the ministry of Jesus, we see through the death of Jesus on the cross, we see particularly through his resurrection from the dead that Jesus always, always spoke the truth. Jesus here is speaking a truth that is stuck. It is uncompromising. A lot of people are very, very uncomfortable with this message. And yet Jesus doesn't tell it just because he wants us to feel bad, just because he wants to torment us, just because he wants us to feel condemned. Jesus is saying this for a reason. The reason is the same reason that Jesus always spoke about hell. You know, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven in his teaching and in his ministry. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is because God does not want us to go there. It is God's will that none should perish, but at all should come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at this parable, it's very easy to look at it and think, oh, well, the, the rich man was obviously evil. He was obviously a wicked man. You know, he, 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 he allowed that beggar. He knew the beggar was there and that the, the beggar wanted feeding and he did nothing about it. He was a wicked, evil man. Jesus never says that. Jesus simply says that he was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. He's just living his life. He's just being who he is. He happens to be a man of wealth and he's just enjoying his life. He probably doesn't even notice that there is a beggar at his gate. And even if he does notice, he's too concerned with his own life to give it much regard. And before we start condemning him for that, how many of us? see the reports of famines and wars and crises around the world and we think we really ought to do something to help those people but then so many of us get back into the next op uh, episode of coronation street or whatever it is and we just forget that those people are even there nobody's being particularly wicked in doing that they're just so concentrated on their own life that they forget and so we see that Lazarus dies. There's no mention of a burial. He may just die and literally be consumed by the dogs on the street or buried in a pauper's grave somewhere. There's no, there's no evidence of what happens to him. The rich man, however, is buried. He's probably buried with great ceremony by his family, with great religious ritual and much wailing and, and a, a, a lamenting his passing. Lazarus is just gone. But we see Lazarus taken to heaven, taken to the bosom of Abraham, carried there by angels. And yet the rich man is in torments in Hades. As I say, there is nothing in this scripture that indicates that the rich man was a particularly bad man. Equally, we do not see anything that tells us that Lazarus gets into heaven because he's had a rough life. God's not just having pity on Lazarus in taking him to heaven. There is something more going on here. Lazarus is carried by angels 
to the bosom of Abraham. If you turn to Galatians chapter 3, we see what it tells us here about Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 and beginning at verse 7, it says, Know only that those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. When you look at that, when you see what it says about Abraham, there is one reason and one reason only why Lazarus ends up in heaven. It's not because God is having pity on him because he's had a rough life. The reason that Lazarus is taken to the bosom of Abraham is because Lazarus has faith in God. That's it. The rich man is so busy with his own life that there is no faith in God. How many people are so distracted in this life by getting things, by getting somewhere, by becoming known? How many people are distracted by the things around them? And they're not wicked people. They're not bad people. They're just living life with no reference to eternity. There is no faith and therefore they are condemned. The scripture tells us in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no man may boast. There is only one way to enter into paradise. There is only one way to enter into the kingdom of heaven and that is through faith in Jesus Christ and faith in what Jesus Christ came to do on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he bore the penalty for our sin. You said, well, I'm not a sinner. You, you just said it's not about whether you're a wicked person or, or whatever. I'm, I'm not a wicked person. I'm OK. Well, the rich man still went to hell, even though he wasn't a wicked person. And you say, well, well, I'm not a wicked person. Unfortunately, scripture does not bear that out. Psalm 14 and verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Romans uh, chapter 3 and verse 23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God we were all born sinners we need a salvation from sin Jesus wasn't telling this parable just to say if you're a really bad person you're going to go to hell he's saying if you're oblivious if you just live your life as is and you do not have faith, if you don't listen to the warnings that are given, if you don't listen to the message of the gospel, if you don't run to that lifeboat when the tannoy sounds saying, get to the lifeboats. It's a bit like saying that somebody has planted a bomb in a room and you know that that bomb is in the room, but you still stay there, even though there are exits you can get out of. And it's been very, very, very clear to you that if you don't get out of that room, you are going to die in the explosion. If the way out is there, take it. God has made a way. God has made a way. Jesus warned us about hell. He made it quite clear that no matter how well we try to live our lives, there's nothing wrong with trying to live a good life, but it is not the way of salvation. We are not saved by works. We are saved by the grace of God. God knew that we were on that liner. That liner is sinking. There is no rescue apart from the lifeboats which have been provided. Without those lifeboats, everybody on board would perish. But God has provided the greatest lifeboat of all. God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is the greatest rescue package that has ever been put together. Sinful man on a one-way road to hell with no way out, no way of working off their debt of sin was doomed for condemnation and destruction. But in John 3 and verse 17 it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. What are you going to do today? Are you going to stay on that ship, wondering if you can swim by your own good works to the nearest shore, which is thousands of miles away? Or are you going to get in the lifeboat? There is only one. His name is Jesus Christ. There is no other name given by God unto men under heaven by which men must be saved. Salvation is only in the name of Jesus. It tells us here that the rich man, as he is in hell, cries to Abraham. He says, well, let me go back. Let, let, let Lazarus go back and warn my brothers. If somebody rises from the dead, then surely they will repent. And Abraham says to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. God had given his word through Moses and the prophets. He had told men about their sinful state. He had told them about their need for salvation. But so many people are just so busy living their own lives that they don't listen. Or if they do listen, they don't hear. And if they do hear, that they ignore. Jesus says, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. The glorious message of the gospel is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, bearing our death, bearing our sin, bearing the punishment for our sin, paying the debt of sin in its fullness. And then he rose from the dead. And then he said to the apostles, to his disciples, he said, go into all the world and preach the good news. The message of the gospel is being proclaimed around the world. There are many who respond and are saved and we give God all the glory for that. But there are others who hear, who mock, who disregard, who ignore. But they cannot stand before God and say, well, I didn't know because they have heard. Because they have heard. But what about those who did not? hear the gospel well first of all the church has a responsibility to preach the gospel if you hear somebody preaching on a street corner they are doing what god has told them to do not to condemn you but to warn you and to show you the way of salvation paul says regarding those who have never heard the gospel this is romans chapter 2 beginning at verse 12 as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Paul is basically saying here, even if you've never heard Moses and the law, God has still given you a conscience. A conscience that tells you what is right and what is wrong. The Bible says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. Even if you have never heard Jesus Christ preached, there is still no excuse. Nature is declaring the presence of God, the glory of God. Psalm 19 tells us the heavens declare the goodness of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. 
Mankind is constantly being reminded of the presence of God, the power of God, the might of God. And yet they still choose to ignore. God doesn't send you to hell simply because you hear the gospel and don't respond or whether you don't hear the gospel. God sends people to hell reluctantly, I might add, because people are already guilty. People are already guilty because of sin. But God has made a way. God has made a way. God made him who knew no sin, that is Jesus Christ, to be made sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. The lifeboat's there. What will you do with that lifeboat? I, if you are hearing this message, you are without excuse now. Are you going to be one of those who refuses to hear? Or are you going to be one of those who sees the Son of God crucified for you, risen from the dead, offering salvation to you, and accept that free gift, that get out of hell free card. It's only through the death of Jesus Christ that our sins have been paid for. So turn to Jesus today. If you've been hearing this, God has been reaching out to you. He's shown you the escape route. He's shown you the way. So turn to the way, use the way, Get out by the way. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So take that escape route today. Come to Christ. God bless you. And now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you today for the blood of the Lamb, which means we can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and favour in time of need. Father, our brothers and sisters in Vietnam have great need right now. They need strength. They need support. They need to be able to live their lives in the face of persecution, of being ostracized, of being monitored. Lord, I thank you that you are with them. I thank you that you have promised to never leave them, to never forsake them. And thank you, Lord, there is nothing that can separate them from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that they would know your presence with them today in a real way way that they would tangibly feel the presence of your spirit with them guiding them helping them leading them i pray especially for those who have been ostracized those who have been cast out of families cast out of communities that they would know you the father to the fatherless the husband to the widow lord they would know you lord that you would give them the strength to continue following you. Lord, I pray that you would enable them to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, that they would know your comfort, your peace, your protection. I pray according to Psalm 91 that you would command your angels concerning them to guard them in all their ways. I pray that you would keep them safe from prying eyes. I pray you would keep them safe from those who would monitor their activities. Most of all, Lord, help them to stay strong in their faith. Lord, I pray you would give them a boldness in witness, even in the face of everything they're going through. And Lord, I pray that that nation of Vietnam would turn from communism and embrace the gospel. Lord, I pray too regarding this war in Ukraine. Lord, every day we hear more and more reports of lives lost, of civilians in particular killed. Lord, I pray that you would spare innocent lives, that you would cause bullets to miss their mark. You would cause bombs not to explode or to misfire in the first place. Lord, I pray that you would 
protect the lives of innocents. And Lord, regarding the conflict itself, Lord, you are the God who makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. And we come to you again saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, you have said that we may ask anything according to your will. And your word declares you to be the God who makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. So we believe that wars ending is your will. And so, according to your will, we ask that you would bring this conflict to an end, that you would enable those who are refugees to return home, that you would enable communities and families to be rebuilt. I pray that you would comfort any who have lost loved ones. And Lord, I pray for all those ministering in that stricken nation, that Lord, you would help them, you would keep them safe, and that they would bring the love and the comfort of the gospel in jesus name amen amen well god bless you it's been wonderful having you with us today and i hope that you have been blessed if you want to know more about what it is to follow jesus christ then please get in touch we would love to hear from you if you are ready to receive jesus christ as your lord and your savior if you know that you are a sinner and you cannot save yourself and you need a saviour, Jesus Christ is the one who saves us. And the, God, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable hour. If you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you just need to go one stage further and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means surrendering your life to him. It doesn't just mean saying a phrase. It means you surrender your life to him. You turn away from your old life of sin and choose to follow Jesus with him as your Lord. Before God and before men, you declare Jesus to be your Lord and you follow him as well as you can from this point forward if that's you and you are determined in your heart today that you want to be a follower of jesus christ you need to be saved then i'm going to pray a prayer praying this prayer in itself will not save you this is simply to help you put into words what you're feeling what you're experiencing what you're wanting to do so if you mean it truly mean it then pray this prayer with me and Jesus will save you today. The Bible tells us that he is able to save whoever calls upon his name. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I believe what your word says, that I am a sinner. I've sinned against you. I have sinned against my fellow men and women. I have sinned against myself lord i'm sorry for my sin i know i cannot save myself i can never be good enough to eradicate my own sin but lord jesus i believe that you are the son of god i believe you died on the cross for me and i believe that you are risen from the dead and you are able to save any who call upon your name so, Lord, I call upon your name today. I ask you to save me. I ask you to set me free from the power of sin. I ask you to forgive the sins that I have committed. I ask you to wash me clean by your blood shed for me. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit to enable me to follow you with all my strength, my soul, my heart and my strength from this point on. Jesus, I surrender my life completely to you. You are now my Lord and I choose to follow you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a true child of God. Thank you that you are even now preparing a place for me. Jesus, I will love you and serve you and follow you as best as I can for the rest of my days. Giving glory to God and giving thanks to you 
for saving even me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've meant that, if you've truly meant that prayer, then Jesus will have heard that prayer. Jesus loves it when sinners call upon his name for salvation. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's you now. You are now a child of God if you truly meant what you prayed. It's just one last thing I would like you to do. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Please get in touch. Let us know that you have surrendered your life to Christ. We would love to pray for you, pray with you, meet you if possible, and encourage you as much as we are able in this new life as a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're anywhere in the Clevedon area, we meet at the Community Centre on Prince's Road at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. It would be lovely if you were able to come and join us there and meet with us there. If you feel a little bit um, scared about walking into a room full of strangers, then get in touch and we can arrange for somebody to speak with you on the phone or to actually meet with you, have a cup of coffee with you, whatever, so that you can uh, get to know us uh, in, in a slightly less... Um, for want of a better word, confrontational way. You know, you, you won't be walking into a room full of strangers. If you're not in the Clevedon area, then please, please get in touch anyway. We would love to hear from you. But above all, let somebody know that you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. It's not always an easy life, but it is a life of true fulfillment. It's the abundant life that Jesus came to give and eternal life that you are now walking in. We're back here again on YouTube at the same time next week. That's 10 a.m. UK time. So until then, may God bless you and may God keep you. God bless you. Bye-bye.